Last night's Alfred Korzybski Memorial Lecture presentation from Lance was indeed wonderful. And yes, let's give it up for Lance. Lance is also the author of a new work titled Media Ecology, An Approach to Understanding the Human Condition. The questions at the beginning of the book include what does it mean to be human? And how does human communication, consciousness, and culture change over time and in concert with the changing circumstances in which we find ourselves? Lance then teasingly quotes humorist Douglas Adams when he states that media ecologists, and I would say general semanticists as well, are interested in, quote, the kind of questions related to life, the universe, and everything. And I think that pretty well sums up what we do here at this symposium. We are people interested in everything. Later in the work, Lance takes the theoretical model of media ecology and places it within the scope of human existence and phenomenological experience by intro introducing us to the writings of Lewis Mumford, as he states, argu arguably the first major media ecology scholar. And he quotes Mumford when he says, what is man? What meaning has his life? What is his origin, his condition, his destiny? To what extent is he a creature of forces beyond his knowledge and control, the playthings of nature, and the sport of the gods? These questions lie at the heart of our human spirit and provide purpose and context to our historical quest for understanding the relationship between the symbolic, the technological, and the biophysical. This past summer, I had the good fortune of engaging these questions in a rather deep way. As the director of the W.M. Keck Digital Media Lab at St. Mary's College, I was approached by Ben Kassira, founder of the Kassira Family Foundation, to enter into a sponsored research partnership focused on exploring the ideas and concepts of the late Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Titled The Human Energy Project, the idea was to perform background research as well as to develop a pilot study to investigate what Teilhard described as the techno-social dilemma of human action and direction, with techno-social dilemma referring to the explosion of technologies and the resulting effects on society, culture, and person. The work of Ben Kassira through his KFF Foundation may be familiar to many of you. For example, in 2003, Kassira founded the nonprofit company SciArc, dedicated to digitally recording, archiving, and sharing through advanced laser optics, the world's most significant cultural heritage sites, and ensure that these places continue to inspire wonder and curiosity for decades to come. Through partnerships with National Geographic and the Smithsonian Museum, the SciArc project has already captured 3D images of some of the world's most treasured heritage sites in countries like Pakistan, Mexico, Iraq, Germany, China, Greece, Armenia, Canada, Australia, Japan, Peru, Turkey, Belgium, Italy, Egypt, Cambodia, England, Pakistan, the Antarctic, and several major sites in the U.S including Mount Rushmore. But Ben Kassira's real passion is the philosophical writings of Teilhard de Chardin. And it was these writings that inspired the origins of the Human Energy Project, which began in 2015 to investigate ways to help alleviate the motivational and ethical challenges, challenges endemic to the above-mentioned techno-social dilemma, especially for younger generations. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a French Jesuit priest, noted for his research as a paleontologist and geologist, as well as for his groundbreaking work on a unique cosmological perspective on human consciousness and the evolving universe, specifically his development of Vladimir Vernadsky's concept of the noosphere. While Teilhard expanded upon Vernadsky's concept of the noosphere, a word in the ancient Greek meaning the sphere of mind, he also conceived the concept known as the omega point, in which there is a maximum level of complexity and consciousness towards which he believed the universe was evolving. Teilhard's scientific research was notable and respected due to his work on the team that discovered the Piltdown Man that allegedly was the missing link in the evolutionary chain. 
a discovery that was later proven to be fraudulent. Despite the disappointing result of, his, of this project, the experience sparked the interest in Teilhard to more actively pursue his burgeoning interest in paleontology in general and evolutionary consciousness in particular. He would go on to spend much of the next 20 years of his life doing research in China and publishing his theoretical works on cosmic consciousness, books that quickly became banned by the Catholic Church and not officially published until his death. At the heart of the Human Energy Project were Teilhard's theoretical models, especially those of complexity consciousness in the noosphere, and they served as a foundational lens for our exploration of contemporary avenues of research for the study. Complexity consciousness is based on the observed phenomenon of the tendency of matter to become more complex over time, and the same time to become more conscious. Historically, three primary narratives have helped humans frame the broad sweep of evolutionary theory. The first is a reductionist model that posits that creation is a random event that sprang forth unaided from any external forces. The second view is a theological model, oftentimes re referenced as intelligent design, and takes the opposite approach by ascribing creation's causality to some intelligent force, usually God. The third story, as theorized by Teilhard and proposed by this research project, places evolution in a, mo in a middle position, recognizing the randomness of the evolutionary process while also recognizing that time itself has a direction that is guided by our own evolutionary development. The law of complexity consciousness continues today in the form of the global socialization of humankind, and as humans continue to come into closer contact with one another, their methods of interaction continue to complexify in the form of superior organized social networks, which contributes to an overall increase in consciousness or the noosphere. As first theorized by Teilhard, the noosphere is the sphere of human thought enveloping our planet above the biosphere and is significantly younger in terms of its appearance, thousands of years versus billions of years. As noted by Marshall McLuhan, quote, rapidly we approach the final phase of the extensions of man, the technological simulation of consciousness, end quote. Or as Jeremy Sherman stated, Quote, only now, with an explan explor explanation for the emergence of hierarchical levels, can Chardin's foresight be supported scientifically in ways that yield promise for noosphere-like complexity consciousness. In the evolutionary development of our planet, matter complexified from inanimate to plant life to animal life to human life, or from the geosphere to the biosphere to the noosphere echoing the earlier work of Alfred Krzyzewski's categorical schema of, of chemical binding, space binding, and time binding. As evolution, as evolution rises through the geosphere, biosphere, and noosphere, matter continues to rise in a continual increase of both complexity and consciousness until it reaches what we have coined a flashpoint in which global self-reflective awareness makes its first ontic awakening. It is this flashpoint that was our focus. The summer pilot project employed several uh, college faculty members along with three undergraduate students, and we utilized um, several methodologies for our data collection, including an extensive literature review, expert interviews, and the development of a social science quantitative study looking at attitudinal responses of millennials and Generation Z students to the themes presented in the study. And to better help the research team to frame the scope of this exploration, four sets of overarching questions were developed, two sets addressing scientific issues, one set presenting sociological questions, and the final set of questions focused on ethical concerns. These were the scientific questions that we were looking at. The first set looks at complexity consciousness and asks, what is the scientific basis and evidence for this process and evolution? How well is, is it accepted, and can it be considered a scientific fact? The second set is a global consciousness, the next step in evolution of the human race. What is the scientific basis and evidence for the process? Are there theories developed as to how this process works? And are there theories postulated as to the end result of this process? The sociological questions start with recognizing that Technological proge uh, progress has been accelerating rapidly, while social progress has seemingly been at a standstill. What kind of problems, if any, has this disjunct in progress caused? 
recognizing that scientific discoveries such as the discovery of randomness of the universe and a directionless evolution have led to the inference that evolution is meaningless, to what extent have those discoveries eroded traditional beliefs? And have they caused loss of meaning and identity, especially with the young? How has this erosion affected people's ability to answer the most fundamental of human questions? Where do I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? What is my role? And what percentage of people, especially among the young, try to answer these types of questions? And what are the motivational and ethical challenges associated with not having answers to these questions? And lastly, we simply asked a couple of ethical questions. What is the state of ethics in the technology-driven age? If evolution is moving towards the noosphere or a global brain, what is the impact on ethics and other aspects of human behavior? And is there any philosophical or theoretical framework emerging in the field? So, unfortunately, time doesn't permit a review of the many and varied aspects of this project over the summer, but I can share with you some of our conclusions and a brief set of some recommendations. Our first set of scientific questions generally asked if scientific evidence exists for the process of complexity, consciousness, and evolution, and how well is it accepted in scientific circles. Our preliminary findings suggest that there is a developing body of contemporary research that supports complexity consciousness in evolution. Much of the research is in the area of complexity and emergence theories as a counterman to the purely reductionist methodologies favored by much of the scientific com community. Jeremy, Sh Jeremy Sherman warns that it's not possible to compel scientists to reach consensus in support of complexity consciousness based on a mere description of the historical record of hierarchy. Since such descriptive work falls into the realm of philosophical specul speculation. As he correctly notes, philosophers diverge from theories while scientists converge on them. And not just by means of empirical support, but through better explanations for phenomena. Sherman surmises that the most fundamental mystery in the sciences at present is the transition from matter to mattering. Researchers in this area familiar to many in this room include Terence Deacon, our 2013 AKML presenter, who's also a research associate of Jeremy Sherman, um, Stuart Kaufman, David Chalmers, and our very own Bob Logan, who's also been collaborating with Terry Deacon and Jeremy Sherman for some time. And uh, you can read uh, Terry, uh, Bob Logan's uh, compendium of some of that research in uh, the uh, two issues of uh, Etc., volume 71.4 and 72.1. Um, there's um, some wonderful stuff there from Bob. When taken together, our second set of scientific questions asked if there are theoretical models that postulate such an evolutionary direction and provide insight as to how these processes work. At first blush, it appears obvious that there is still no specific event or causal theoretical model that empirically provides definitive answers. However, Jeremy Lent asserts that humanity is entering a period of transformation on a scale that has occurred only twice before in history, the agricultural revolution and the scientific revolution combined with the agricultural revolution. Both of those leading to a post-human techno-society and a sustainable human flourishing, what he dubs the great transformation. David Chalmers adds that the essential difference between the cognitive easy problems and the phenomenal hard problem is that the former are at least theoretically answerable via reductionist philosophical models. Chalmers instead proposes a naturalistic dualism, naturalistic because mental states are caused by physical systems such as brains, and dualist because mental states are ontologically distinct from and not reducible to physical systems. And Terence Deacon frames his research in what other theories try to deny, that although mental contents do indeed lack these material energetic properties, they are still entirely products of physical processes and have an unprecedented kind of causal power that is unlike anything that physics and chemistry alone have so far explained, echoing exactly what Corey was talking about earlier. Deacon traces the emergence of this special causal capacity from simple thermodynamics to self-organizing dynamics to living and mental dynamics. Now for the sake of time here, there's only three minutes left. Uh, let me just say that in terms of the sociological questions, um, we had uh, uncovered 
a whole lot of already existing uh, sociological research into the millennial generation and Generation Z, looking at their attitudes and frames of understanding for these larger um, ontological questions. And as you would expect, there is a direct correlation between their involvement with the digital age uh, and the digital technologies and um, loss of capacity for what we might term in a broad sense interpersonal communication. Um, and that we have we uh, got lots of statistics for that. Also in terms of um, the questions about ethics, um, as you would expect, the ethical questions are indeed also um, very much uh, up for grabs right now in terms of our understanding of where we're going with them as we live in a world increasingly becoming um, uh, more difficult to discern the real from the surreal. Um, so I want to conclude, I still have two minutes left here. Uh, I jump to the, I'm going to jump to the end of this. Let's just say that in terms of a purpose to evolution, a 2013 Pew study reported that 6 in 10 Americans say that humans and other living things have evolved over time. Well, a third reject the idea of evolution, saying that humans and other living things have existed in their present form since the beginning of time. Of that, 60% take the view that evolution is due to natural processes, such as natural selection. However, many Americans believe that God, or a supreme being, played a role in the process of evolution. Indeed, roughly a quarter of adults say that a supreme being guided the evolution of living things for the purpose of creating humans and other life in the form it exists today. And less than 30 percent of Americans, according to a Pew study poll, say their personal religious beliefs conflict with science, while 68 percent say there is no conflict between their own beliefs and science. And the literature also suggests that some young people may use the internet to search out validation for religious belief and or other um, uh, ideologies. To conclude, I want to echo a couple of more words from Lance. Having strengthened the conscious mind through literacy, we can now use the electronic media to engage the unconscious in a self-conscious manner. We are continually exposed to our dreams and our nightmares through television, film, and the internet, and we are discovering that there are many more monsters from the id out there than we ever expected. But we are confronting them with full awareness. I think, therefore, it possible that we may find a way to integrate the conscious and unconscious minds to embrace and absorb the shadow, the anima and the animus, as Carl Jung referred to the components of the, uh, of the unconscious. Jung believed that such integration would lead us to the next stage in the evolution of consciousness, and it may be that this will happen as we interiorize our electronic communications However one feels about Jung, it does seem that our survival as a species may depend on our ability to raise our consciousness to some higher level." End quote. Thank you, Lance, and thank you all. Thank you.